I'm Chandler Precht, a program manager at the Earth Institute. And today I'll be hosting three panelists for this installment of the sustainability space, coastal sustainability in the face of sea level rise. I'm joined today by Bill Precht, director of marine and coastal programs at Dial Cordian Associates, Nancy Gassman, assistant public works director for sustainability for the city of Fort Lauderdale, and Sam Whiten, director of coastal resilience at EA Engineering Science and Technology. In the face of global climate change, there is no question that coastal communities are vulnerable to sea level rise and extreme sea level events, including high tides and more intense coastal flooding. In turn, these communities will experience enhanced coastal erosion, changes to coastal ecosystems and impeded drainage, among a number of other risks. So today our panelists will be discussing how sea level rise is affecting coastal communities and resiliency efforts in their line of work to mitigate these impacts, in particular, Panelists will be discussing case studies in Florida, North Carolina, and Alaska. So to start us off, we have Bill Precht. He is both a geologist and ecologist by academic training. Since completing his graduate degree from the University of Miami Rosenstiel School of Marine and Atmospheric Science, Mr. Precht has specialized in the assessment, monitoring, restoration, and rehabilitation of various coastal resources, especially coral reef, seagrass, mangrove, and marsh systems. To date, he completed the first ever book on coral reef restoration, published over 350 peer-reviewed scientific journals, book chapters, and abstracts, presented over 100 invited lectures, and been featured in two award-winning nationally broadcast documentaries on coral reefs. Aside from his work at Dal Cordian Associates, he serves as an adjunct faculty to Northeastern University's 3Cs East-West Marine Biology Program, and he also co-teaches a class here at Columbia on the geology of Barbados. So Bill, please take it away. Thank you. Uh, today, what I'd like to do is use both my hats as a geologist and an ecologist and talk about the history of, of what we know about sea level in space and time, and then how recent global climate change is impacting sea level rise and specifically how it's in affecting the ecosystems and sustainability space in South Florida. So the problem of sea level rise is both local, regional, and global in scale. It's directly linked to global warming. We already have annual flooding events occurring here in Florida. And the future projections of sea level rise will impact, clearly impact our sustainability space. And that's essentially what we're gonna talk about today. And I'll specifically end this uh, presentation with the response and or failure of natural barriers to this sea level rise and the need for man to intervene or not in, in terms of sea level rise in our communities. So geologically, one of the things we know is sea level has fluctuated over the last few million years due to glacial interglacial cycles. And at the last interglacial maximum about 125,000 years ago, sea level was at least eight meters higher than it is today. And here's an example of what Florida looked like at the last glacial, interglacial maximum 125,000 years ago and see that the peninsula is incredibly small compared to what it is today. However, at the last glacial maximum 20,000 years ago, sea level was much lower, about 125 meters lower than it is today, and the broad peninsula of Florida existed. You can see now what the peninsula looks like, and if sea level rise continues, and increases to three to five meters above present, it will look like panel A. Now, this is a link of essentially the, the time series that we saw in that earlier graph of sea level, but this is annual temperatures, uh, or I'm sorry, temperature plotted over time versus CO2 concentrations. And note that sea level is linked to temperature and then temperature is linked to CO2. The important thing to note here is, as I pointed out, and you'll see my cursor here, at the last interglacial maximum 125,000 years ago, sea level was six to eight meters higher than it is today, and temperatures were warmer than they are today, but CO2 concentrations were lower than they are today. So this portends uh, in incredible rises in sea level over the next centuries to millennia. And here we have, again, that same graph, and you can see how the Industrial Revolution has caused a dramatic rise in CO2 over the last hundred or so years. Currently, the present CO2 measured in parts per million 
at Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii is 412. Just for a context of geology, the last time it was in excess of 350 parts per million was during the Miocene epoch or about 24 million years ago. And how do we know this? From this wonderful curve that's put together at Mauna Loa Observatory that started with the PhD work of Keeling at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And since his completion of his degree in the mid 60s, this curve has continued uh, and is currently run by NOAA. And notice that there's a high low annual variation, and this is a seasonal variation, Northern hemisphere, uh, higher CO2 levels during the winter, lower CO2 levels during our summer when photosynthesis is active. My screen appears to be locked. Okay, here's a projection of future sea level rise. Uh, and basically you can see the slow Holocene sea level rise till today, and then the potential Anthropocene sea level rise based on melting of the uh, glacial ice sheets. The question is, is sea level rising today? And the answer is yes. This is a tidal gauge record from Key West, Florida. And this record is 120 years old. And you could see the change in sea level over that period of time. And this is the global average of absolute sea level change over that same period of time. And this is from monitoring stations around the world as well as recent satellite measurements. Now, many people have also heard about king tides and this has now become an annual problem in South Florida coastal communities. And here is a tide gauge record for Virginia Key, Miami Beach uh, for the last 15 years. And you can see this same trend as in the Key West trend of an upward, ever upward increase in sea level but notice that there is annual variability of uh, extreme highs and extreme lows. The extreme highs follow a tidal bulge on the earth. And in South Florida, that tidal bulge is generally uh, seen in the fall months, uh, specifically October, November, when we have the highest of our king tides. If you also look at the projections of that sea level rise in, in time over the next century, this is what the progressive inundation of the Miami coastal area, including Miami Beach uh, and, and Miami downtown look like. And notice, this is what it looks like today. This is South Beach right here where my cursor is. And this is what the projection is of Miami Beach uh, in approximately 80 years. So you can see a, a, a rapid uh, diminution of the island size uh, related to the flooding due uh, sea level changes. Now, also related to this sea level is, and, and coastal flooding, is the increase in hurricanes and, and global temperatures. And this is a graph showing through time the increased frequency of hurricanes. And you can see that that curve essentially follows the temperature curve for the last hundred years, which all also follows the increased sea level curve. So we have seen as ocean temperatures have increased an increase in the frequency of tropical hurricanes. And of course, in South Florida, that is important. And right now, the 2020 season is the most numerous hurricane season ever in the tropical Atlantic basin with 30 named storms to date and counting. There's also a link with temperature to hurricane intensity. And this is a study done at MIT that shows a clear link between the intensity of hurricanes with increased sea surface temperatures, which are the fuel for increased hurricanes. So in South Florida, not just do we have an increased frequency in hurricanes, but an increased intensity that mixed with our tidal ch changes and sea level rise uh, portends doom to the coastal communities. Uh, this is a photograph that I took just last week after the passage of Tropical Storm Eta in uh, Sarasota, Florida. And this was just a small tropical storm when it made landfall in, on the Gulf Coast of Florida. But the high watermark from this storm was one and a half meters higher than present natural high level sea level. 
So just in a minor tropical storm, you can see that the effects of storm surge are tremendous. Now, what are natural barriers to the sea level rise in South Florida? Well, specifically we have three ecosystems, coral reefs, seagrasses, and mangroves that are important to this uh, protection of the sea level. Ex and these natural barriers from a study done from the Nature Conservancy shows that coral reefs can reduce up to 97% of energy, mangroves can reduce 66%. So when you look at this, in terms of shielding property values, it has a tremendous value to the homes and the communities and the coastal areas of South Florida just by having uh, in integral uh, preserved natural ecosystems that serve as a, uh, an area to protect these toast coastal communities. Unfortunately, for reef protection, is restoration and reef protection the answer in South Florida? Well, unfortunately, North of Miami, there are no reefs that actually grow to sea level. Most of these reefs are, are actually submerged. So therefore, this is an example of the reefs north of Miami and their depths are located between 10 and 15 meters below present. These are relic fossil reef systems and they do not pr protect shorelines like the reef systems in the Keys and other islands. Mangrove communities also serve as a great protection. Unfortunately, approximately 90% of the mangrove shoreline in South Florida has been deforested in the last uh, 50 to 100 years. So research shows that mangrove conservation can pay for itself in flood protection. The question is, are we willing to uh, provide mangrove protection in areas because this is an area that then increases uh, mosquito in density and people who live on the shoreline don't want mangroves blocking their view of the ocean. So we have to see what the, what the balance is here between being able to do that. Another thing is beach nourishment projects. And beach nourishment projects usually take shore from sand from offshore, push it up on the beach and it's spread around. And some people think this is financial folly because the sea level is ever inundating these areas and these sands are always lost but others think it's important investment, especially in South Florida, where ecotourism drives much of our economy. Dune restoration stabilization. This is two projects I've been involved with uh, here in South Florida, where actually dune stabilization is uh, planting dunes and stabilizing the dunes from encroaching sea levels, which also help protect the beach. Uh, and of course, now we're in a situation where in some cases, we have gone to unnatural barriers uh, for protecting our, our coastal communities. And this includes seawalls, as well as pump stations uh, to rid areas that become flooded. And with that, I'd like to turn it over uh, and thank you, Chan. Thanks. Thanks, Dad. Um, now we will be hearing from Dr. Nat Nancy Gassman. She received her PhD from the University of Miami, researching a variety of issues impacting coastal ecosystems. Her public service started with Broward County, Florida in 1995, working on integrated water resources planning. She transitioned to directing the county's environmental monitoring program, including fostering construction of a LEED certified environmental chemistry lab. While with Broward, she supported the development and implementation of Broward County's climate change action plan and managed the county's energy and sustainability program. She has been a major contributor to developing technical tools for the Southeast Florida Regional Climate Change Compact, including the Unified Sea Level Rise Projection for Southeast Florida. In 2014, she joined the City of Fort Lauderdale. As the Assistant Public Works Director for Sustainability, she provides program oversight for fleet services, solid waste and recycling, stormwater operations, environmental and regulatory affairs, and sustainability and climate resilience. In her current role, she implements sustainability, climate mitigation and adaptation strategies within government operations and throughout the city. Thanks, Nancy. Thank you, Chandler. Well, the, the topic of my conversation today is really how do you build a resilient and sustainable coastal city uh, in the face of sea level rise? We have a number of stressors and shocks that impact our local area. We have rain from above. We have sea level rise attacking us from the east. Because of our unique geology, our groundwater table is rising 
And because of our location within the, the regional water management system, we receive the stormwater drainage from our Western communities. So we're being uh, attacked on all sides by water coming from so many different locations. In addition to that, we understand that sea level is continuing to rise. Within the city, the expectation is that by the year 2040, we will see in the range of almost two feet of sea level rise uh, from the 1990 baseline. And by 2070, that could be four feet or more. In terms of king tides that Bill had mentioned, if you look at the record of king tides uh, predicted over the course of the year 2020, what you see is that as, as Bill noted that early in the year, our high tides tend to be lower. And then later in the year, in the August, September, October timeframe, they tend to be higher. And while the average high tide is shown there in red, you can see that the threshold for flooding in very low lying areas of Fort Lauderdale is in the range of 1.3 feet. And those king tides that we're receiving on an annual basis exceed that flooding threshold. And so we can, we can adequately predict the timing of the king tide impacts, but we can't adequately predict how high those tides will actually come in. In the Port Everglades area of Fort Lauderdale, we have a, a dedicated tide gauge. And what we have seen over the course of the last three years is that in 2018, we had 46 high tides that exceeded the threshold for flooding in the city. That number in 2019 more than tripled at 170 high tides. And through this year, 2020, through October, we've seen 101 high tides that exceeded that threshold. So sea level rise is absolutely having this progressive change and impact on the city of Fort Lauderdale. Now, the way that we are dealing with it is that the city commission adopted the fast forward Fort Lauderdale, our city, our vision plan for the year 2035. And as part of that vision plan, a, we developed a strategic year, a five-year strategic plan that, that focuses very clearly on building a sustainable and resilient community. And there's a number of uh, objectives that are included within our strategic plan in order for us to look at our infrastructure, our stormwater plans, to ensure that we are building a community that is ready for these future conditions of sea level rise as we make those investments today. And the way that we've built this culture of resiliency is starting with the vision plan and then moving into the strategic plan. We also do an annual survey with our, our residents and ask them what their perceptions are of how the community is doing, uh, including are you noticing sea level rise? Are you noticing that there's additional uh, heavy rainfall events? Are you noticing that it's warmer? And the commission takes that feedback from the neighbor survey and they put it into a series of annual actions uh, that they want to focus on, top priorities. And usually there's five to six of those top priorities. That information is then put into the proposed budget to ensure that we are funding those things that are most important to the commission as well as to uh, our neighbors as, as the survey has directed. And then for the larger projects, that information is also incorporated into our proposed community investment plan. We've also tried to ensure that we have put sea level rise into our DNA by looking at the annual uh, sea level rise projections from the Southeast Florida Regional Climate Change Compact and incorporating the latest information available into each of our master plans. And so that our, our seawall master plan has been um, designed and uh, researched based on what we are projecting for future sea level rise. And that's also true for our stormwater master plan, our comprehensive utility strategic master plan, our parks and recreation master plan, and even our cemetery master plan have included the information about sea level rise and more extreme rainfall as part of our studies for how we wanna move forward. And then again, all of the information and the 
critical action plans that are incorporated into each of those master plans is then incorporated into the way that we are investing in our capital improvement plan moving forward. We've also incorporated sea level rise into our comprehensive, um, our comprehensive plan called Advanced Fort Lauderdale. We have now have a dedicated climate change element have, and have included climate related concerns and policies into each of our, our critical elements within that comprehensive plan. And we also have developed what's called the Fast Forward, Lauder, Fast Forward Fort Lauderdale Design and Construction Manual, easy for me to say. Um, into this document so that we have a menu of potential specifications for different locations within the city that have special concerns if it's low lying and maybe tidally influenced, if it's a little bit higher but uh, more extreme rainfall may be a concern. The design and construction manual provides a menu to uh, the engineers that are working in the public realm to understand what uh, they can incorporate into that particular uh, look. So how do we end up funding these critical resiliency projects moving forward? Within that five-year community investment plan, there's a dedicated chapter that talks about what we call adaptation action areas. And that's a special term that's, that was developed uh, in state code in order for local municipalities to incorporate areas and designate areas where they are designating special funding to address coastal, coastal flooding and vulnerable locations within the, the coastal area. And you can see from the map on the left that we have currently 17 different areas that are designated as adaptation action areas and 42 capital projects that have been listed for funding over the course of the next five years. And those include $200 million in water and sewer investments to help make that infrastructure more resilient and we also have $200 million set aside in order to do stormwater improvements and deal with some of our tidal flooding concerns. So here's the stormwater master plan. Uh, those are the seven neighborhoods that we are going to be focusing on. Each one of those has been designated as an adaptation action area. And we've, we've currently moved forward $70 million for two of those neighborhoods, River Oaks and Edgewood, uh, to fast track those improvements uh, we recently had Tropical Storm Ada come through. It dropped over 10 inches of rainfall in two days, which the city probably could have managed most of that rainfall, but we had had 25 inches of rainfall in October. And with completely saturated conditions, a number of those neighborhoods uh, flooded as a result of that more extreme rainfall. So it really highlighted the need to do these additional improvements in those locations. And the way that, that drainage works in the South Florida area is that you've got a house that is sitting up on a yard. The roadbed is slightly higher than the storm drain and the yard is higher than the road so that when it rains, the roads flood first. And it, it's a way to protect the homes in order for rainfall to come down into the storm drain. But nature has an interesting way of taking advantage of the best intentions of human built systems. When we have these more extreme high tides, the, the water, the tidal influences come up our storm drain system and through those storm drains and it ends up flooding the road and, and the yards. And so the city has invested rather heavily in something called a tidal valve which is a, a one-way valve that prevents that water from being able to come up into the storm drain system and it keeps the road dry. And, and you can see at the top of that slide, the city has already installed 177 of these valves and we plan to install another 200 over the course of the next five years. The picture on the left is a king tide that happened on September 28th and the Arrow is just showing you a location that's duplicated in the slide on the right. At high tide on the 28th, the high tide came in and it flooded this, this neighborhood. The street was completely inundated with salt water. During the low tide, staff went in, installed a tidal valve in the catch basin that was uh, causing the issue. And on the following day during the next high tide, the road was dry. And so these tidal valves can be extremely effective in addressing tidal flooding. 
But we also have tidal flooding that's caused by seawall breaching. Uh, on the right side of that slide is a canal, and you can have a hard time telling where the road ends and the canal begins. And when that happens, that creates other conditions that are problematic for us. Even though this street was outfitted with tidal valves, as the seawall breaches, the water comes in, it comes up and over the swale area, and it backfills. So there's no way to prevent flooding in this location uh, once the seawall breaches. So the city adopted a policy, uh, an ordinance, which mandated that all new seawalls have to meet a minimum standard height and that the city can cite property owners who have seawalls that are allowing tidal flows to leave their properties and impact either their neighbors or the adjacent roadways. So in concluding my presentation, these are some of the critical numbers. The commission named resiliency related to sea level rise and other climate change issues as a number one priority for the year 2020. Annually, we're spending about three to $4 million on stormwater improvements uh, at, the, at the street level. We have five different infrastructure master plans that incorporate sea level rise as a part of our long-term planning for our investments in infrastructure. We have $70 million already allocated for stormwater improvements over the course of the next five years, 177 tidal valves, and we've also installed 3,100 feet of new seawall that is city-owned seawall. And the picture at the top of this graphic is showing you how tidal flooding was impacting the Isle of Palm uh, area before we built the seawall. And then the new seawall is on the right, and it's showing you uh, during one of our more extreme high tides this September, and the road is completely dry due to that construction of that new seawall. And so with that, I'll conclude my presentation and hand it off to the next speaker. Thank you, Nancy. Finally, we are joined by Sam Whiten. Sam is the Director of Coastal Resilience at the consulting firm EA Engineering Science and Technology, where he started his career and where he has now worked for over 20 years. He began as a lab tech in the company's aquatic ecotoxicology lab and eventually transitioned into a focus on ecosystem restoration projects where he developed his technical skills supporting designs for the restoration of anadromous fish passage, coastal marsh habitat, and recently projects addressing vulnerabilities related to sea level rise. He has led specialized teams of engineers, scientists, and risk evaluators to accomplish projects to improve resiliency and water quality for federal clients, a variety of nonprofit partners, and state and local governments. In addition to his technical work, Sam managed EA's New England operation for over eight years before taking on his current role in 2019. Currently, he is a certified ecological restoration practitioner with the Society for Ecological Restoration and is a vice president with EA, where he directs project development related to the restoration and protection of coastal resources, specifically with a focus on issues related to sea level rise and climate change. Go ahead, Sam. Thank you, Chandler. Appreciate it. Uh, so we're going to be uh, changing gears a little bit um, and talking about the uh, opposite end of the country up in Alaska as a case study to start with um, after I give a little bit of an intro on, on myself and, and the company that I work for. Okay, so a little bit of background on, on the company that I've been working for for over 20 years. Uh, we're uh, headquartered in, in Maryland. We've got offices all over the United States, uh, founded in 1973 uh, by a professor from Johns Hopkins. Um, we're a public benefit corporation that's uh, exclusively focused on the environmental space. Uh, so we don't really do uh, much in the way of uh, traditional civil engineering or transportation or things like that. We're just focused on environmental issues and are made up of uh, engineers, geologists, and scientists uh, that address those issues. As Chandler mentioned, I've been with EA for, for my entire career. I started as a lab tech and uh, as an intern uh, during college and uh, I've remained with the company ever since. So just a quick overview of the presentation. Um, really what I'm gonna be focusing on are, are the impacts of sea level rise upon ecological receptors. Um, the best way to think about this is, is you know, some of the adapt, adaptation techniques that we currently have that folks are aware of, such as raising a house on, on the pilings in a beach community to keep it from flooding. Well, the question uh, is also has parallels to, to ecological impacts. What do we do to those habitats or how do we support those habitats um, in, in a similar manner? How do we make sure that they don't get uh, destroyed or, or severely impacted as, as we see sea level rise occurring? 
So as we, as we understand how those impacts uh, upon those ecological receptors are happening, there's a lot of research uh, that's been done over the past uh, 10, 20 years and, and beyond um, about those, those transitions uh, that occur. Um, and, and as we work hard to make sure that we stabilize the rate at which our seas are, 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 are increasing, um, you know, what are we gonna do in the meantime uh, to make sure that those critical habitats um, aren't, aren't lost completely? So this presentation focuses on, on the impact of sea level rise upon ecological receptors, as I mentioned, uh, specifically looking at the use of natural and nature-based features um, to address those impacts. Um, so how do we, how do we address uh, sea level rise issues in a way that, that doesn't just, uh, you know, we don't just uh, put walls up, uh, that we do something that's also beneficial to, to the environment uh, and that also gets uh, at a, in a more resilient uh, shoreline as, as it changes uh, throughout years to come. So I'm gonna start with a, a project up in Alaska. Um, this is one that we've uh, just started working on. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a really uh, unique uh, effort in a very unique community. It's a phenomenal um, community of folks and, and, a, and a phenomenal uh, uh, location of the US. And I'll talk about its location in a second. Um, the village uh, can, claims to be the con longest continuously, in, continuously inhabited community within the Americas. It's just north of the Bering Land Bridge. Um, so it's, 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 it's been around for a while. Um, there's about 750 inhabitants within the village, 93% uh, uh, of whom identify as Inupiat. Uh, it's 200 miles north of the Arctic Circle. Um, it's in the same general vicinity. Again, in Alaska, things general. I, I live in Rhode Island, so it's, it's a little bit different to say one side of the state versus the next when you're talking about Rhode Island versus Alaska. So um, one of the nearest communities is, is uh, um, um, uh, formerly known as, as Barrow, which is the, um, which is the largest uh, U U.S. village uh, north of the Arctic Circle. Uh, so they've got a good connection with that, um, with that uh, city. Um, as far as access to the community, there's no road access at all. The only access is via air. Um, and then there's very limited barge access in the summer months. And then obviously via snow machine um, during the winter months. However, again, uh, the community, you know, there's not a lot of communities in this location. So with such limited availability, uh, you know, the, the, the prices of food and, and other stuffs are, are, are very high, very high indeed. Um, and so the community heavily relies on the local fish and wildlife populations as a food source. Um, and again, I'll talk about that, some more about that in a second, um, about the critical nature uh, between um, the surrounding uh, ecology of the village and, and how important it is uh, for, um, for the uh, community food source. So the, the village itself, as I mentioned, is about 200 miles north of the Arctic Circle. You can see on the left there, uh, the star uh, with location and in relation to Fairbanks and Anchorage, which are the two largest cities within uh, Alaska. And then on the right there, you can see uh, the general makeup of the, the village itself. It's uh, located on a, on a gravel spit that uh, sticks out into the Chukchi Sea. Um, it has traditional uh, village resources, like a lot of villages in the lower 48. Um, things such as a water treatment plant, sewer treatment plant, landfill, uh, it's got the airstrip, uh, and then there's also a lot of cultural and historic features uh, that are related to a uh, location of the, the previous village, which was which they moved out of in the 70s, uh, but then also a lot of other um, culturally important um, features uh, that are being impacted uh, due to sea level rise in addition to uh, loss of sea ice over the years, which again, I'll speak about a little bit more later. Again, just as a, as to, to better place um, the community and, and the importance of, of things that, that folks in the lower 48 might not be used to, um, the, 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 the village is, is, has historically um, relied upon the whale, specifically the bowhead whale throughout the years. And so again, as I mentioned, with, with the very difficult ability to, to get uh, outside food sources in, um, they've relied on the, on the whale as, as, a, as a very important source, not only for food, um, but also for, for housing construction, for uh, cultural um, events. Um, and so as you can see there, um, a statement from one of the, the uh, um, village elders, um, you know, the whale is the center of everything for the people, it's the center of their lives. So again, the connection between um, the, the ecosystem and the environment is, is much different than, than folks might be used to. Um, and therefore, as, as there's impacts to, to climate and sea level rise, that has a, a, a very direct impact upon daily life and, and cultural um, um, uh, events as well. The picture in the lower right there is, is, a, is a sod house uh, that, that was built uh, with support from uh, whale rib bones um, and other, other um, pieces of whale. 
and they just uh, the community members moved out of those uh, homes in the in the 70s uh, pretty recently. So again, you can imagine um, that the, that's pretty harsh uh, conditions, uh, cold temperatures and wind. Um, and so that the again, this is uh, the, 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 the close knit nature of the community to to the environment is, is very important. These are just some photos I took in February, again, uh, showing the importance of, of the whale. Uh, the picture on the right is, is the, the cemetery, which is um, ringed by uh, jaw bones and, and rib bones from the whale. Uh, again, no, no part of the whale goes to waste. Um, so it's, it's, very much, um, it's very much utilized um, for, for lots of different reasons. So getting into the specifics of what exactly um, the issues are and what we're doing this to support, um, as I mentioned, the village has had to deal with issues related to erosion and sea level rise. Um, as, as Bill pointed out, sea level rise has been occurring um, for, for quite a long time and throughout, throughout our history. Um, it's, it's, it's continuing, the, the rate is increasing, so there, those, those problems are, are acutely um, coming to, 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 to fruition for, for some of the, the again, the, the vulnerable sections of the community. So, Really, there's there's an impact to um, to their ice cellars, which is where they store a lot of their um, a lot of their whale meat and other uh, fish and wildlife, um, and so this impacts um, directly their their subsistence way of life. And and in in addition to that, there's also more traditional impacts such as flooding, um, and then additional changes to wildlife patterns um, because again of, of the changes uh, not just with the sea level, um, but also ice and and other climate factors. So this is a quick um, uh, figure showing the rate of erosion um, and the, the community on the right there. A significant loss of shoreline over the years. Um, and as that shoreline changes and that loss occurs, again, the threat to uh, various um, infrastructure resources and culturally important resources um, continues to, to, to become more and more problematic. This is a, a figure or a set of photos of the ice cellars. As I mentioned, this is where they traditionally store most of their uh, foodstuffs. Um, as permafrost is lost and as erosion occurs, these ice cellars are lost. Um, and when they're lost, uh, you know, obviously that food stuff has to be replaced. So which put, applies additional pressure on fish and wildlife and whale communities. Uh, in addition, uh, it, as, as some of this meat is lost, um, it increases potential polar bear activity uh, into uh, close proximity of the, the village, which again is, is problematic. This is a set of pictures um, on the right there showing the changes in the sea berm that offers some level of protection for the village. Uh, the picture on the right uh, is just an indication uh, that obviously when you go outside of village boundaries, you need uh, some level of uh, support uh, when it comes to uh, protection from polar bear activity. So it's a little, little different uh, as far as data collection goes uh, in this area. So specifically, um, getting back again, as I mentioned, we're just getting started on this project uh, due to COVID. Things have uh, lagged a little bit, so we haven't been able to travel, obviously. Um, as I mentioned, that you know the the the, the traditional nature-based solutions that we look at in the lower 48, looking at you know uh, general ideas of vegetation or something like a rain garden, those things obviously don't apply um, in an Arctic environment. So there's there's different things that you have to look at uh, to help stabilize um, shorelines and 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 again to, to look at um, uh, making sure that you don't have an impact on uh, ecological receptors. So the, uh, the, the bullet in the lower left there um, is, is really important to note that, that we're not just using Western, uh, traditional Western science and engineering approaches, but we're working with uh, village elders and some of the traditional Nupiat knowledge. Um, almost more, it's more important really than some of the traditional uh, data collection and, and approaches that we take. It's really important to learn from um, everything that the community has done over the years, because that's really where um, you know, they, they know far, far more um, than, than any of the folks uh, that, that um, you know, are in the in lower 48. So um, that's really important. Um, so we're, we're really in the data collection mode, as I mentioned. Ultimately, we're looking at developing three, um, three uh, conceptual level designs to protect those ice cellars and, and possibly develop other um, uh, uh, features that, again, help promote um, ecological services as well as uh, some level of flood protection. Um, so with that, I'll move on to uh, next project. Uh, this project is funded um, through NOAA. It's a it's a it's a, 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 a research and and um, application uh, focused project uh, through a program called the Ecological Effects of Sea Level Rise. And what really we're doing, we're looking at two different sites: one in the Beaufort, North Carolina area, and one in the Jacksonville, Florida area. 
and we're looking to uh, beneficially reuse dredge sediments to improve uh, marsh resiliency. So, so really, what what's the problem uh, that we're looking at? You know, the problem definition really relates to to uh, coastal marshes uh, drowning essentially due to sea level rise. Um, ordinarily, you, uh, without uh, in, in influence from from man-made features, um, marshes will traditionally um, migrate inland um, as sea level rises. Um, as you can see there on the right, um, if if the marsh itself is able to keep up with sea level rise, it, it, it by in doing so it traps sediment uh, and raises its elevation naturally. Uh, so you really have these two different ways of of a, a natural process: either the marsh moves inland or the marsh moves upward as as sea level rises. However, what happens when there's a, a man-made feature such as a bulkhead that prevents that migration of the marsh moving inland or that the marsh isn't able to, to keep up by accretion? Um, so in, in that instance, essentially what happens is you have a conversion of marsh to, to open water. And so that habitat is completely lost over time. And uh, as, you can, as you can visualize, um, you know, when that happens, that, 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 that marsh never comes back. The only way it comes back is if you apply uh, sediment or soil to uh, to that location. Um, and so that's really what this project is, is looking at. Uh, thin layer placement is, is kind of the, the generally accepted term for taking dredge material and thin layers and putting it onto the marsh surface. Um, it's really, it's been used in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, uh, but has, has started to, to be focused upon uh, recently after her Superstorm Sandy, um, mainly because again, it, there's a realization that, that a lot of these marsh systems aren't able to keep up with sea level rise. So we're trying, uh, folks across the country are looking at different ways of, of applying sediment. Uh, they're looking at the, the effectiveness of it and making sure that as, as you can imagine that, that there's not harm done um, that's, that's greater than the, than the fix that, that's being applied. So this is just a quick visual, or not visualization, a quick couple of photos of, of a couple of projects, one in New Jersey, um, which is this uh, uh, placement technique of thin layers called rainbowing, uh, where essentially the dredge material is just sprayed out onto the marsh surface. Um, there's other low uh, pressure systems that also can apply the dredge material. Uh, and then there's more traditional just uh, bulldozing techniques that push um, the dredge material or sand in this case um, over the marsh surface, again, in an attempt to um, to provide additional ecosystem services once the marsh comes back fully vegetated, um, but also it does provide some level of flood protection, um, in, usually in conjunction with other types of flood, tech or flood protection techniques. So uh, in starting to wrap up here, I did want to just mention from a professional development standpoint, um, you know, as far as these types of projects, it's key to have a, a good blend of science and engineering. Um, experience uh, because you really do need both. Um, consulting firms such as mine, ha again, as I mentioned at the onset, have a good mix of of those uh, of, of those um, um, uh, service areas. So um, I would encourage folks to to make sure they don't just focus on one side of science or engineering the other. It really takes a good blend. Um, and then as far as uh, you know, the bottom bullet there, there's there's a lot of different agencies and 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 types of organizations that are focusing on. Uh, natural nature-based features is a way to deal with sea level rise, academia, governmental, private, NGOs, um, and it really is up to you and, and what your specific professional goals are on, on what uh, sector you'd actually want to pursue for future job opportunities. But there's a lot, there's, there's, it's a growing field. So with that, I'll leave it for questions and discussion. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much, Sam. Uh, now we will be taking questions from the audience. Hi everyone. So I, uh, I just want to start with um, a quick thank you to Chandler and our panelists for this excellent discussion. Um, your insights into the field of coastal sustainability are really appreciated. Um, so with that, we can get started with our questions. Um, this first question, I believe, is for Bill. And the question is, in the graph that shows sea level versus CO2, we know there's have we know there has been spikes due to natural events. How do we know the current spike we have is man-made if there are also natural occurring cycles? Um, how do we know it's natural versus anthropogenic? Well, what we do know is that starting with a study on greenhouse gases by Challenger performed in 1938, coupled with continued research, there is a direct link between the trapping of gases, specifically those emitted from the burning of fossil fuels, as well as the burning of forest timber over the last uh, 
since the Industrial Revolution, essentially, that have created this increase in CO2. And what we do know is that from ice cores, where CO2 has been trapped in, in the bubbles of ice over time, that there has been no time, like I said earlier, in the last 24 million years, where CO2 has exceeded 350 parts per million. And right now we're over 408, 410, give or take. Um, so this increase, this steady increase, is, has been directly linked to, um, to the burning of fossil fuels, as well as uh, the burning of and deforestation of, of large timber areas, especially in the Amazon. Um, I would direct you to the IPC report, especially the work of Michael Mann from Penn State University, uh, where there shows a clear and direct link between uh, CO2 and sea level rise. Great, thank you. The next question, regarding Miami and or the greater Miami-Dade region, what are some of the flagship coastal resiliency projects that utilize nature-based solutions that you deem as successful? What types of nature-based strategies is Miami executing well? What are they doing poorly in? And what do you believe Miami could do better in terms of protecting the city of Miami and its critical coastal ecosystems via eco-restoration nature-based solutions? Well, because I talked about Miami, I'm guessing that's for me as well. So, um, specifically from a nature-based standpoint, uh, in a combination with county, city, and the federal government through the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, there have been a number of beach nourishment projects throughout Miami-Dade County, uh, which have uh, greatly increased the width of the beach. And in fact, uh, South Point, which is uh, Miami Beach, is one of the longest, most successful beach nourishment projects in the United States. Uh, so in many areas where beach restoration has been failing, uh, that has been a critical success. Um, also, I mentioned some dune restoration, rehabilitation and stabilization projects. And many of those have been performed by the local county agency in Dade County called DERM. Department of Environmental Resource Management. And some of those projects have really been exceptional and they've shown the ability to withstand even the strongest of hurricanes. Um, there is currently uh, some ongoing operations to increase, increase uh, mangrove restoration as well as coral restoration uh, throughout Miami-Dade County. Uh, the question here is one of that of the future because neither have been implemented on a scale large enough to see whether or not they will be successful at protecting vital uh, resources, natural as well as uh, built areas out in uh, Miami-Dade County. But there has been a tremendous investment in recent years, especially at the uh, Rosensteel School at the University of Miami, where coral restoration programs have been gaining a tremendous uh, momentum. And as I said before, unfortunately, there are no natural reef systems in uh, South Florida, north of Key Biscayne, where the reefs grow to sea level. So that's one strike against coral restoration. But um, again, right now, the most successful projects, I would say, are those that have been focused on beach projects and the ones that have been the least successful or have <clears throat> the least data to see what the performance is are those in the sub uh, marine environment, including seagrass, mangrove and coral restoration. Great, thank you. So the next question, uh, what are some challenges and barriers in creating policies surrounding coastal cities? And do you know what are the main barriers in implementing policies specifically in South Florida? So I think I'll probably grab that one for a second. Uh, the challenges in the past have been the willingness of the elected officials to 
truly embrace and understand what the issues were that, that were facing them moving forward. Um, I think we've overcome that barrier that there is a, a very high level of awareness of our elected officials in understanding what the concerns are. And I think we turn more to how the political will becomes policy statements uh, at this point in time. Uh, I think that the, the barriers include funding. When you, when you put a policy into place, there is a cost that's associated with that policy. And sometimes the costs are not minor. Uh, in my presentation, I talked about $400 million worth of infrastructure investment that we are making in our water, sewer, and stormwater system. Those are big dollars. And those dollars come from, the majority come from one place, which is taxpayer fees and taxpayer taxes. And so when you, when you have a policy, and let's say someone decides that they wanna have a policy that says every seawall in the city has to be raised. That's 165 miles of private seawall at a cost of somewhere between $1,000 and $2,000 a linear foot. If you do the math, it comes up to a very large number very quickly. And so making policies that support adaptation have to make sense both economically uh, as well as politically. And so those are, those are some of the, the smaller challenges that are associated with, with those kinds of, of policies is that there's a cost to thinking ahead. Having said that, there are a number of recent studies that show for, for every dollar you put into prevention uh, in an adaptation setting related to sea level rise or flooding, you get $6 back. And so it's, it's a matter of uh, being wise upfront and spending those dollars to invest in your community to provide for that resiliency moving forward. Great, thank you, Nancy. Um, and you mentioned infrastructure, which actually brings us into our next question um, for you. If there is a reason people keep developing high-end and expensive infra infrastructure in Miami and Key Biscayne, if we know hurricanes and sea levels are rising, um, and I, I guess as a follow-up to that, um, if there is a statewide effort to mitigate and adapt, or if it's more of a private sector approach? Wow, big question. Um, South Florida continues to develop across all of our communities. And as long as there is a place that is attractive to live, uh, people will live there. Uh, I recall that when uh, Hurricane Katrina came through, I saw a really interesting presentation where the speaker showed a spit of land that was on uh, a coastal area. And there's this beautiful estate and then a hurricane comes through in the 60s and knocks it down. And then there's a picture in the 70s of the exact same location where there's a beautiful estate and then a hurricane comes down and knocks it down. And then there's Katrina came through and knocked down whatever the next thing uh, is that's built. People will always want to live in these coastal areas. Uh, so there's a balance between making those investments privately or making those investments as a government and doing so in a way that you can guarantee that those investments will be able to live out their, their useful life. Uh, we've always had hurricanes in South Florida. We will always have South, uh, hurricanes in South Florida. So um, I think that, that the entire Southeast Florida region has gotten much smarter about having really good building codes, building uh, according to the uh, Federal Emergency Management Agency's guidelines for floor elevations. And so I think we're doing a better job at, at building structures that will be more resilient moving forward. If you look at the keys, all new homes have to be built with knockdown first floors. They, they're built on pilings because they're built so that hurricane storm surge can run underneath the building and allow for those buildings to be resilient and for people to live there over a longer period of time. So there, there's, there's many good policies and many good building codes that help us do that. Uh, and then the last part of the question was about uh, statewide efforts to mitigate or adapt. The state of Florida has, uh, with the new, with Governor DeSantis coming in, uh, he established a office of a chief resiliency officer. And we have seen a resiliency office be created uh, at the state level. And so there is an increasing focus on building resiliently across the entire state and to take more efforts to both 
mitigate the causes of climate change as well as to adapt to the fact that Florida is a peninsula, we're surrounded on three sides by water, and that if we're not paying attention to what sea level rise is doing, there's not a whole lot of other states that need to pay, pay more attention than we do, so. I'd like to add something to Nancy's uh, response, if I could. And that is, I lived through Hurricane Andrew and lost my house in 1992. And because of that, I now live 13 miles from the coast in a town called Miami Lakes, which is not close to the shoreline. So sea level rise per se doesn't affect my house, but yet the increasing uh, water tables and the effect of the Everglades pushing on our west side definitely has increased flooding over the last few years, including in our community for the first time during Tropical Storm Eta. Uh, when you look long term, there are projections that it will become almost impossible to get long term mortgages for homes in South Florida because insurance companies will refuse to insure those homes. So mortgage companies without insurance will not mortgage. So therefore, unless you pay cash for your home and have it uninsured uh, over time, especially the next 30 to 50 year window for South Florida looks very bleak for those very rich folks that live directly on the coast. But I, I, I'll, I'll add something to Bill's comment to my comment which is that if you look back 50 years, this community did not look the way it does today. And so as we look 50 years ahead of time, our community will change and adapt and evolve with time as the conditions change. And so will there, will, will there be areas where we will no longer have residential neighborhoods? Yes, um, but we may start residential neighborhoods or different commercial districts in different locations than what we saw 50 years ago. So we have to remember that communities evolve with time and that if you have good policymakers, they are preparing the community to adapt over time as well. Great, thank you both for that. So our final question uh, for this event, should cities consider managed retreat as a possible adaptation strategy to avoid repetitive loss of lives and property as well as restore the land to create more open space and buffer zones. I would just like to jump in and say that I, I hope that Sam would answer this one because I think specifically Point Hope would be an interesting case study for this and what you think uh, about Point Hope and the question in regards to that. Sure, yeah, I mean, it's, I. You know, I, I think a lot of us think of, of, you know, the conditions that are happening as things that are going to happen in a few years or 50 years out from now. But as I mentioned about Point Hope, they've already moved. Um, they've already adapted. Uh, and they have over, you know, over several hundred, possibly thousands of years. Um, so, you know, as you know, so to, to specifically answer the question, yes, I mean, we're going to at some point, uh, a number of cities are gonna face the, you know, the inevitable reality that you can't keep building walls and building yourself higher. Um, so we should start to think about how, how we're going to adapt, how cities are going to move um, and how that's gonna happen. Um, because, you know, if we wait for, you know, for, for something, for really something really catastrophic, it's gonna be too late. So I think that, um, you know, in those areas where relative sea level rise is, is, is very much, uh, problematic now, and we know it's going to be problematic. We 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 must uh, start to adapt, and we must start plant start the planning process, um, and learn from folks like the 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 community of Point Hope. Um, they've moved. They had some challenges. Um, they continue to have challenges because of that shift. Um, but there's communities in Louisiana, Chesapeake Bay, um, that are already starting to move, have moved, or or have been lost. Um, I was just in a community in Chesapeake last weekend, uh, Smith Island, that's lost several communities over the years and has moved those communities over the years. Um, and, and again, it's, it's, not, um, it's not what everybody wants to see happen, but uh, you have to plan and uh, the better you plan, the better off you're gonna be um, you know, it, as, as, as you face these issues. Great, thank you. We did actually get one more question, if we could just uh, devote one minute to this. Um, and the question is for the speaker is, can you comment on climate gentrification in Miami and the way projects and decisions are being prioritized in terms of community vulnerability? Well, oh. I'm, I don't, 
I have not worked on any projects with the local uh, governments in Miami. So my presentation from a Miami standpoint was uh, from the natural resource perspective. Uh, but Nancy may be able to uh, provide some input from what Fort Lauderdale is doing and if Miami is doing similar type things. Yeah, so climate gentrification is a is a relatively new term and the idea that uh, it, neighborhoods that are in higher elevations may become gentrified because um, of the elevation of the neighborhood. And so we are seeing that to some degree in Miami that the the higher elevation neighborhoods are becoming um, a target for new development, uh, which is causing what could be called climate gentrification. Uh, I think that one of the major topics in the climate community and those people who are working on climate change is the idea that we are not all equally impacted by climate change, that there is uh, equity issues in how climate is impacting people. Uh, if you live in a community that, for example, can't afford air conditioning, climate change is going to have uh, a greater effect on you as it gets warmer than for those communities that are more affluent and, and have air conditioning. So I think that this is really an emerging topic that there is a lot of uh, emerging emphasis on how equity and gentrification will be impacted by climate uh, moving forward and how people move in and out of areas will also be impacted by their socioeconomic status to be able to adapt to climate kinds of issues. So it, it, it's a topic that I think we're going to be seeing a lot more discussion on moving forward. Well, if anybody has further questions, you can of course reach out to any of the panelists that are listed here. And thank you for joining us for this installment of the sustainability space.